the first time I met my trafficker, I was 17. Um, and I was introduced to um, dancing in a strip club. And then that's kind of the way I kind of entered the dark world of trafficking, which I was in for about seven years off and on. Um, and I tried to leave as, you know, a lot of people, that's the main question is like, why did you stay? Why didn't you leave? Um, and I tried to leave um, several times. Um, one in particular, I left um, one time and then he actually said, hey, um, if you don't come back, I'm going to kill your mom and your daughter. At least every couple of months I would try to go seek medical treatment. I went there to, you know, see if I can, you know, just check to see if I had any STDs, um, to see if I can get condoms, and also to um, make sure that I took birth control. Um, but when I went there, um, no one ever really asked me, like, what's going on and how come you come in so often? Um, you know, they're, they're not asking, why do you want to take you know, STD tests, you know, so often. Um, I, I think there were signs um, that, and questions that they could have asked, but they didn't. As healthcare providers, we're one of the few people in society that have the opportunity to see victims while they're being trafficked. And if we don't know how to recognize the signs and symptoms, the things to look for, we're gonna miss them. That needs to change. Dignity Health decided a number of years back to take on human trafficking as a healthcare system. Dignity Health's Human Trafficking Response Program is a system-wide initiative to educate staff on how to identify signs and symptoms of, of sex and labor trafficking and how to respond appropriately, meaning how to respond with victim-centered care and trauma-informed care and how to connect patients uh, with the right resources in the community. This program was implemented in all of our hospitals, beginning in the emergency department. So first the emergency department, then labor and delivery and postpartum. And now we're uh, rolling the program out housewide in each acute care facility. It is so important to educate everyone who works in a healthcare system on human trafficking because um, uh, a security officer can see signs or symptoms in a person that's waiting out in the parking lot. It's important for registration staff to be educated on signs and symptoms because they may see dynamics happening between the patient and the companions in the waiting room that the physicians and the nurses wouldn't see. You have such a short amount of time. So just these different opportunities that you have, it's like we have to act on them. My name is Sarah. I am a third year resident physician at the Mercy Methodist Family Medicine Program. I think that compassion is a starting point. Um, and it's, it's absolutely a necessary starting point in working with this patient population. But it's that acknowledgement that this is really hard for the patient and it's gonna be really hard for the provider. Um, and in that acknowledgement saying that's okay and I'm willing to do that because this is important and I'm willing to do that because I care about you. We've also recognized that there's a need to translate that inpatient acute care into something more longitudinal uh, because many of these victims have gone through significant amount of trauma um, over the course of weeks, months, even years. And these aren't problems that are gonna resolve in that first 24 hours. And, and so we also transitioned into a model where we created a medical safe haven where victims and survivors that are in the community can come to us and be seen in our clinic by staff that's all been extensively trained in trauma-informed and victim-centered care. Having a facility that has everything in-house has completely changed um, our program with City of Refuge. It's having direct access to doctors, having personal relationships with them. Dignity Health Medical Home is there isn't anything like it. We are able to have a woman in crisis or a woman who has suffered um, complex and severe trauma, we're able to bring them directly to the clinic, be there with them, and have them looked at holistically. The doctors are well trained, they understand what this lifestyle looks like and what these women have been through, and they are able to take care of them in a way that we have never seen. I think that 
every clinic needs this training because victims are across this country going in to seek medical treatment. Thinking back to my exploitation, had the staff been trained back then, my life may have turned out a lot differently. The hardest part about the training for me has been realizing all the patients I could have missed. And, and that's, that's the difficult part when you start to realize just out of ignorance or um, yeah, just out of ignorance, you didn't know to ask those questions and you didn't know that those were patients that you may have been able to help back then. Incorporating this education, this training, with my residents at my clinic was a very small increase in our utilization overall. There's 537 family medicine residencies alone this, in this country. So I think it absolutely makes sense to put this care and this education and this training into residency clinics. It's working so well. I mean, it's just working incredibly well, and why not take this model that's working so well and replicate it? Then we have widespread care and we're training the doctors of tomorrow. It's a dark world. It's so dark that you have to fight daily to see the light, like even after you leave. Like you have to fight daily to make sure you hold on to hope because it can seem like so hopeless. There's no way out for these kids and these victims. But then I think of myself and I'm like, there is hope. There is hope.